things. Shane asked me, are we, um, are we having the veterans stand up today? And I told him, I said, no, that's Veterans Day. And I would remind you that at Memorial Day, we don't remember the veterans who have lived, we remember those that have died. At Armed Forces Day, we remember those who are actively serving. And on Veterans Day, we remember those who have served, but are no longer actively serving. And so those are the three uh, national holidays and, and what they mean. And uh, I hope that, that you remember that. Uh, as a gold star grandkid, you know, you remember my grandfather was killed in the Vietnam War. Um, I, I especially am reminded of the fact that it costs a lot for a country to be free. And so we're thankful for those men and women who have graciously given their lives in service. I am always pleased when Brother Gillum is able to come, but I'm always infinitely more pleased when Sister Gillum is able to come as well. <laughs> and we're glad that both of them are able to be here. We're glad that uh, Sister Gillum's health has improved of late, that she's able to travel with her husband, and that she's able to be here with us as well today. And uh, I hope that you uh, get some time this week to, to sit and chat with them and get to know them. They're a lovely couple. Uh, if you want someone to talk to, with, talk with Sister Beth. Uh, Brother Tom is an introvert. <laughs> by nature. It's not that he's rude, he's just by nature. Well, maybe he's rude too, I don't know. He's a preacher. So a a as a preacher, we have this tendency. You know? No, but we're, we're glad that they're able to come and be with us. And uh, I always joke that, that Brother Gillum is Stacy's favorite pastor. Uh, I don't make the list, but since the last time he was here, Dr. York says that I'm his favorite pastor, Baptist or otherwise. So, just so Stacy's aware of that, I told her that one time, and, and then the next week I asked her how the sermon went, and she said, I don't know, call Dr. York and ask him. <laughs> so, <laughs> Brother Gillum, if you'd come. And, and I assure you that Shane meant absolutely no disrespect by singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic when there were a bunch of Southerners in the house. <laughs> If you have a Bible this morning, you'll find our text in Matthew's Gospel. I'm always fascinated with Memorial Day. They have been national champs for a while now, but... Uh, they were interviewing kids in our newspaper and they asked a little girl what Memorial Day meant to her. And she said, it's the day the swimming pool's open. <laughs> so uh, I hope you brought your kids further than that in what Memorial Day means. It is a joy to be here. I think this is the fifth or sixth time I've been here at Grace Baptist. Of course, I was fascinated the first time anybody wanted to hear me, and uh, five times I'm thrilled and amazed, <laughs> thrilled and amazed. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter number seven, I have been of late uh, drawn to the various and sundry storms in the Bible. There are six major storms in the Bible, and it is my intentions in these days to look at five of them, uh, one each service. I do not believe they were stuck there for filler. I don't think the Bible writer was writing and says, hey, we ain't mentioned one of them storms lately, let's stick one in. I think they were stuck for a purpose into every life a storm must come trouble tragedy heartaches sorrows calamities sickness you know old people here this morning your body's falling apart is it? it is your birthday 
too many of them. Financial storms, family storms, mental storms. I don't think you would not agree with me unless you got your head in the sand that America's in a storm. And so I'd like to look at those five storms under this thought of sailing over life's stormy seas. There is some truth in each one of these storms that if we could lay hold to them, they may help us in our storms. And if everything's all well at your house, I tip my hat to you. Take these sermons and put them on the back burner. Just put them on, don't cut it off. Oh, no, 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 no. Just put it on simmer. It may be that you would move them to the front burner before the sun sets today. Calamity can come suddenly and quickly. I hear tell it's only one phone call away. The greatest tragedy in all your life. I want to begin this morning in Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 7, at this storm. It's hidden away. Oftentimes we don't see it. But I see it as the purpose behind all storms. God will never send you any trouble. That this won't always be the purpose behind every one of them. The Bible says in Matthew 7 and verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon that house. Sounds like a storm and it fell not how come for it was founded upon a rock everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand the rains descended the floods came the winds blew and beat upon that house Sounds like a storm, same storm, different houses, and it fell. Great, great. Some of you sitting here this morning, soon there's a storm coming into your life, and because of what you're building upon, great will be the fall of your house. The purpose behind all storms all storms come for one reason, to try our faith. You say, what in the world does God want to try my faith for? Doesn't he know that I have faith? Why, well, certainly he's the one that gave it to me. What in the world would he want us to try it for? So that you can find out if you've got it in you. Storm. Thing this morning. Satan is so deceptive that you could be sitting here this morning thinking you're building upon a rock when by all intents and purposes you're building upon a sand and it'll only be revealed to you when a tragedy strikes. As we begin to unpack that thought this morning, I want to look at some settings, some truths from the Bible that may would reveal to you, reveal to me, just exactly what is it I'm building upon. Is it a rock? You wouldn't have to go very far to figure out what that is. Jesus says that I, and the rock of ages. Are you building upon Christ? Or are you building upon sand? As 
we begin to look at that truth, I want to begin this morning in Ephesians, if you have the Bible there. And I want to look, first of all, we're asking ourselves, what am I building on? Is it rock or sand? There will be some truths that will be very evident to us if we're building upon the rock. Ephesians chapter number one. I want to look first of all this morning at the manifested control of God. Just how much control does God have? I hear people all the time say, well, I tell you, preacher, I believe God's in control of everything but. <laughs> yeah, he's in control of the buts too. Amen. Whatever it is you think he's not in control of. The manifested control of God. I notice in Ephesians chapter number 1 he has powerful control. Have you ever bought into this foolish thought? That God has a permissive will and he has a perfect will. We love to think in the terms that if something bad tragic happens to me. Oh, that was God's permissive will. He just permitted it. But if it was good, oh, that was the perfect will of God. One small problem. It ain't nowhere in the Bible. Wouldn't want to confuse you with the Bible. But this is in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 11 in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all I did not know if you see that word or not I thought I'd underline it all things after the counsel of his own will did you notice that will does not have an S on it he does not have any plan B he only has plan A a. And if you are building on anything else than the fact that God has one will for you and he's going to work it out and it is going to involve tragedies and trouble and if you build on anything else it is sand. Great will be the fall when the storm comes. I'm talking about the powerful control of God. Could I mention also his particular controls? He says by the Old Testament prophet Nahum, chapter 1 and verse number 3, says the Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. The little word way has the idea of riding it. God says I ride upon all storms. So if any trouble comes into your life, don't blame it on the devil. Oh no. God says I rode that in. You listen to me this morning. To think any other thing. Sand. He says in Psalms 29 10, the Lord sitteth as a king on a throne while the flood ravished the earth. What was God doing when he destroyed the entire world with a flood and saved but a handful of people and sent the entire universe to hell with the clothes on? He says, I was sitting upon a throne watching it all to build upon anything else. You say, I don't like a God like that. Take it up with him if you ever see him. <laughs> to build on anything else is to build upon sand. I remember years ago watching Fox News one morning after the awful hurricane that came through New Orleans and so devastated the city. She tells me, I, I don't know if it's true or not, she tells me that me hollering at the TV, they can't hear me. <laughs> But sometimes I feel like it helps. But they had a well-known preacher on there, if I called his name, you say, oh, yes, I know him. 
And they asked him, was God behind the storm that hit New Orleans? And he told the little girl, no, it was a freak act of nature. I hollered at the TV, wrong! The Bible says that God rides upon the storms. He says, I wrote it into New Orleans. You said it's probably because they're so wicked. Well, if that's true, he should have long since rode one into Athens, Georgia, where I live. And if I'm not mistaken, he probably should have already long since rode one in here. Are you listening to me this morning? Oh, it's not global warming we're concerned about. It's not China that we ought to be scared of. But it is Almighty God this morning that has the power over it all. I was wondering this morning, not being nosy, God forbid I stick my nose into your business. Stopping right here and going no further, would you say with what you've already heard, I preach, I know one thing, I'm building on a rock. Or are you building on sand? As we go further this morning, if you have the Bible there, Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, could I mention not only the manifested control of God, but could I mention the multiple comforts of God? The multiple comforts of God. In the book of Ecclesiastes and uh, chapter number 12, I notice with storms, there is a conflicting comfort. When storms come, this is awful deep. I don't even know if you can get this. No, you have to have a doctor's degree in theology to even get this. My greatest fear of storms, here it is now. It's, you know, you, you, it's so deep, I don't even know if you can get it or not. Our greatest fear with storms is that it's going to kill us. And that's what you were scared of with COVID. You know why you wore your mask? Thought it was going to kill you. So what's the worst thing that happened to you? Die and go to heaven, walk the streets, go. Ooh, that sounds like a tragedy. See, it is the problem is because we've got a saying theology about death. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3 that if you be redeemed, you're already dead in Christ. So if I'm already dead, it would be extremely hard for me to die. Isn't that what he told Martha down by the graveside at Lazarus? He says, he that believeth in me shall never die. Amen. You're looking at a guy this morning that cannot die. It is impossible. You say, preacher, you're crazy. We've had them laying right here in the graveyard dead. They fooled you. You paid good money for somebody to come over and do a neck check on them. But I assure you this morning, if they were the redeemed, they exhaled here, took one step into eternity, caught their breath, and they're still breathing and shall breathe forever. I love the hound out of there. Well, stop and shout. I know Yankees don't shout. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 12. A conflicting comfort. Our thoughts about death. Death is a gain. Death is not a loss. I'm reminded of a dear preacher friend of mine. He was in a foreign country several years ago. And and Brother Larry was telling me that uh, he was on a foreign airline and it was very clear that the plane was crashing. It was going down nose first quickly. And uh, somebody asked him, was he scared? He said, yeah, he said, scared, very scared. 
He said, was you scared of dying? He said, absolutely not. He said, I knew I wasn't going to die. He said, how come? He said, if I was going to die, he said, God would give me dying grace. wouldn't have been scared. But he said, because I was scared, I knew I wasn't going to die. So if there's anything going on like COVID and cancer and all that and you're scared to death, there's a good chance you ain't going to die. Because if you're going to die, he'd give you dying grace. You wouldn't be scared of nothing. I love that, don't you? That, that's rock theology. That's not sand theology. I was drawn to this little verse in Ecclesiastes 12. We're talking about a conflicting comfort. It has a lot to do with our idea about death. Death is not a loss. Death is a gain. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 6, he says, or ever the silver cord be loosed, the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. The spirit shall return. And the little word return here is, it, it is often used in another sense, fly unto God. My mother-in-law, several years ago, God give me this illustration. Uh, she loved candy kisses. Uh, matter of fact, she had a dish of them beside her bed in the hospital. Uh, my wife inherited that love after she died. My wife says that's why God gave you two jaws. You can put a candy kiss in each one of them. He says, is ever the silver cord be loosed? When I left my mother-in-law's room, I noticed that over the threshold of the door, there was one of the silver cords from the candy kiss laying across the threshold. And it dawned on me, that's exactly what had happened to my sweet mother-in-law, Ann Hamblin. God had come and he had pulled the silver cord. And the real Ann, the sweet kiss Ann, she had flew to Christ. And we were left with the wrapper. The real Ann was gone. You know, my wife and I, we often eat candy kisses in our two recliners. And we stack the wrappers up on the table. And we have never, ever cried over the wrappers. Uh, I just can't throw it away. I can't stand the thought that they're in the dump. No! Come, it's just a rapper. The real person flew to God, and one day he'll glorify the rapper. <laughs> he'll put the real person back in the rapper, and we shall dwell with him forever. That's rock theology. That's not sand theology. Are you listening to me? There is a comforting in this conflict. But I notice if you have the Bible there, we're talking about building on a rock. What are you building on so far with what we have discussed? Preacher, it's coming more clear to me as you go through this sermon. I am building upon a rock. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Not only is there a conflicting comfort, but there is a comforting comfort. Have you ever bought into this sand theology? God won't put no more on you than you can stand. You ever bought into that? It's foolishness. Are you listening to me? Where do they get that at? Oh, they got it from Paul's writings. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. 
There it is, preacher. Won't ever put any more on you can bear. Small problem. Temptation is a solicitation to do evil. God says, I'll never allow the devil to solicit you to do evil above that you're able to take it. But we're talking about trouble. We're talking about heartaches, tragedy. This is what the apostle Paul, this is the fair-haired boy. This is not some redneck from Pennsylvania or Georgia. This is the one that wrote over half the New Testament. This is what he said about trouble. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant. I love that little word, ignorant. Air, A-I-R, airhead. <laughs> air go in here, air come out there. Those who think God won't put any more on them than they can take is their foolish airhead. That's what Paul said. We're not have you, brethren, to be ignorant of our trouble. Totally different word than temptation, heartache, tragedy, difficulty, which came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure. He said, God put so much on me, it flattened me. I'm talking about the fair-haired boy now. Wrote over half the New Testament. If God do that to him, pray tell what may he might do to me. What else? Above strength. He put so much on me, I couldn't carry it. He says, in so much that we despaired even of life. Paul said he put so much on me, I wish I was dead. Wow. God, what in the world would you want to do that to anybody for? Answer to your question in verse number 9. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raiseth the dead. Why in this world is he going to put more on you than you can take so you won't trust your stinking self, but you'll trust him? If you're trusting in yourself and you are got that attitude, well, I don't believe God will ever put any more on me than I can stand, it's foolish, sand theology, and great shall be the fall of it. Well, what in the world would God want to put all of that on me for? 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us all in our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort where we ourselves are comforted of God. When you've got rock theology, God's going to comfort you in your trouble for one reason, so that you can comfort others that are going through like situations. You're listening to me this morning. We've got the Bible there. A conforming comfort. Romans chapter 8. The well-known passage of Scripture. The one that I have been saved long enough, 53 years I guess is long enough, to see this verse come to fruition. I've lived long enough that, hey, it's true. It's true. It's true. R.A. Torrey called these words the soft pillow for a tired heart. It's only 25 words. And only three of them are more than one syllable. So he's kept it real simple. So even us dummies can get it. This is what he says. Romans 8, 28. For we know that all, it's pretty inclusive, things work together for good. You say, preacher, I don't see any good coming out of what I'm going through. Just wait. Just wait. I don't know how long you'll have to wait. Just wait. Just wait. For we know that all things work together for good. For everybody, God forbid. Not for everybody. To them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. Why is he doing that for? For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He's using trouble to conform us to his son. He says he takes all things works them together for good. 
was reminded of that years ago when I first started pastoring in, uh, in Georgia. Of course, that's years ago that I pastored. I've been in evangelism. It's my 30th year traveling the roads. But when I pastored there in Athens, it was a small church. I never could get it very big. I have the gift of taking a big crowd and making it small overnight. I, I don't know why I have that gift. I, it'll operate. You'll see it tonight. About half of you'll be gone, won't come back. It's just my gift operating. Some of you already know that my gift has hit you. You'll not be back. You say, well, I just ain't feeling good. Gracious, you got six hours. You might get to feeling better. You never can tell. But when I first started pastoring there, I... I worked at the Christian school. It was a large Christian school, about 750 students. And I worked for the headmaster, Mr. Cummins. And uh, I saw his fetch it boy. Uh, he had a list for me every morning of things that he wanted to do. And I hadn't been working there but about a week. And uh, I came in one morning and he had a little teeny piece of paper. It's probably just a, like the end of my handkerchief right there. And he had a little dip of paint on there. It looked like a mint green. He said, Tom, he said, go down to the paint store and get me a gallon of this color. Well, at that particular time in my history, these hands had never touched a paintbrush. So the only thing I could figure, I'm going to go in this store with all these cans in there, and I'm going to have to walk around with this little piece of snip of paper and find a can that has that color in it. I walk in the store, and he says, Sir, can I help you? I say, Yeah, Mr. Cummins. Oh, yeah, I know Mr. Cummins. Come on in here. What, what did Mr. Cummins need? I, I said, he says he wants a, a gallon of that color. Oh, yeah, I'll fix you up. Well, he went to the stand, and he pulled out a can, and he took the lid off from it, and it was white. I said, this man don't know no more about paint than I do. <laughs> and he put it under this machine, and he pressed a couple of buttons and pulled this thing, and this big old, like a black glob, dropped in that can. I said, gracious, Mr. Cummins is sitting at me out here, this man more stupid than I am about paint. <laughs> he turned that thing around and pushed some more buttons. It looked like an orangish looking glob. I said, this man is crazy. He put that lid on there, put it on the machine and shook the devil out of that can. Set it up there on the counter, put a paint stick on there and say, what else do you need? And he looked at me in my eyes. He said, you need me to take the lid off that can, don't you? I said, absolutely. <laughs> he took the lid off that can, dipped it, tapped it right beside my little color, put a hairspray on there, and it was a perfect match. He had put a bunch of things in that can that I didn't like. I would have never picked those things. Shook the devil out of it. That's exactly what God's going to do to you and I. He's going to drop a bunch of things in our life that we don't like. He's going to shake us at the very foundation of our soul. And when we show up over there, we're going to be just like him. That's rock theology. That's not sand theology. I was in Wilmington, North Carolina years ago in a meeting and uh, been a bad hurricane there on the coast in North Carolina. Multiple houses had been destroyed on the beach. Million, million and a half, two million dollar homes. And the preacher asked me one day, he said, you want to ride over at lunchtime and look where the hurricane come? I said, yeah, I don't mind doing that. We rode over there and they were already bulldozing what was left of those million and a half, two million dollar homes. They were pushing them over in big piles. And they were already laying the foundation, fixing to build them back. And I said to the preacher, I said, you know good and well, none of this crowd ever been to Sunday school. He said, what? 
I said, you know good and well, ain't none of this crowd ever been to Sunday school. He said, I don't know if I know what you mean. I said, well, you know, somewhere along the line, if they had been to Sunday school, way down in them little grades, they may have sung this song. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rain came down and the floods came up. And the house on the sand fell flat. I remember singing it in Sunday school when I was a little kid and we would fall on the ground. Surely them people in Wilmington, North Carolina had never sung that song. Because the psalm says the wise man built his house on the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. Rains came down. The floods came up. And the house on the rock. I remember when I used to sing it in Sunday school. And the house on the rock stood firm. You listening to me this morning? Scary thing to be building upon sand. I close with the mighty care of God this morning. John 10 says there's a position of care. If you're redeemed this morning, I don't care what you're going through. God says, I have placed you in my hand and my hand is in the Father's hand. The FBI couldn't find me if they was looking for me this morning. You listening to me? Then Isaiah tells us there's a pronouncement of care. He says that he has engraving us on the palms. Engraving us indelibly. Cannot be erased. He has engraving us on the palms of his hands. I was thinking about the two on the road to Emmaus. They didn't know it was Jesus. Although it was his uncle and auntie, they knew him all their life. They didn't know him in his resurrected form. They encouraged him to come to the house and eat supper with them. They said that while he was breaking the bread, Luke said they knew him. I was studying that word new some time ago. To recognize because of an identifying mark on the hands. And I know, I know, I've always thought, oh yes, they saw the piercing hands, the nail prints in his hands. They knew it was Jesus. I think it's bigger than that. I can't help but believe Maybe Cleophas said, I couldn't believe it. I saw my name engraved in his hand while he was breaking that bread. Oh, I don't know what you're going to go through before you leave this world. But we're safe. The almighty hand of God this morning. That is building upon a rock and not the sand. I was thinking about this old southern gospel song again, thinking about safety I find myself in this morning. The old songwriter said, There is an unseen hand to me that leads through ways I cannot see while going through this world of woe. This hand still leads me as I go. This hand has led through shadows drear and while it leads I have no fear I know it will lead me to that home where sin or sorrow e'er can come I long to see my Savior's face and sing the story 
saved by grace, and there upon that golden strand, I'll praise him for his guiding hand. What you gonna sing? I'm trusting to the unseen hand that guides me through this weary land, and some sweet day I'll reach that strand still guided by the unseen hand. Deep, deep, deep theological question to close this sermon. Are you building on sand or are you building on a rock? Preacher, it's yours. Amen. What are you building on this morning? I would say to you uh, that if you make the choice to not show up at any more of the services throughout the rest of the week, you're proving, in essence, what you're building on. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the word that was preached, and we pray, Lord, that it would have a moving effect upon our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would encourage us to hear this and to rejoice in the fact that our awesome and incredible God has us safely in his hands. We pray this in Jesus' name. Dan? Please turn in the hymn book to 499. 499. Please stand as we sing the first and last verses. heaven we thank you for your word given to me to us may we heed your word may we meditate upon it and may we with the power of the Holy Spirit be willing and assured to be obedient unto your word be with us as we depart be with us as we come back again this evening to hear more of what you have for us. This we ask in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen.